What's wrong? Hi, Tyler. Flair says hey, hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I just can't even see your face. I can't see your face or and <laughs> and you can't hear me. So really this is not this is not good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Y'all have fun now. Don't forget to eat. I won't. Love you. you too. Let me know see when you, you get there. Bye. I was going to a friend's house for the football games. Cute. Taylor Swift's gonna be there. <sighs> just another reason I'm uninterested. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> so fun though are you gonna watch it then no 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 (laughs) i i watch the (laughs) no the stuff i watch the stuff on social media after (laughs) hello everyone and welcome to the show i'm blair and i'm kirsten and we are mediocre Mediocre content. content And it is literally Valentine's Day tomorrow. <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. We talked so much about love last episode. You'd think it was like then, but I, you know, it's fine. It's fine. For, we needed it for planning purposes. <laughs> that's right. Because now yeah. you've had a whole week. Also, let us know any progress you've made. If that's your mm. journey, I'd mm-hmm. love to know. Also, do you and Tyler do anything for Valentine's Day? Are you guys Valentine's Day people? <sighs> okay. It all started in fifth grade. Oh, Lord. (laughs) Buckle up. (laughs) This is what you've done. So actually, no is the short answer. The long Mm. answer is uh, I consistently call it Valen's Stupid Day, full disclosure. Um, And the tradition is to actually wear all black on Valentine's Day uh, Mm -hmm. in my family. uh, Mm -hmm. Something that my mom actually actively still does in honor of... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I feel like I've told you this story before. You have. I, now that I yeah. remember. Yeah. So for those that don't know and aren't interested, I'm going to tell you that in fifth grade, I had this wonderful teacher. Shout out to Mrs. Post if you're still around in the world and you just happen to listen to this random podcast. But she was one of my favorite teachers. But she started the whole Valen stupid thing because she told us the story about how she liked this little boy or something when she was younger and like she was really into him or whatever and it was valentine's day and she's like oh happy valentine's day blah 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 and uh you know he gave her a rock that he picked up from the street and she took the rock and threw it at him and decided to just ghost valentine's day for the rest of her life which is really dramatic but we love a a dramatic queen so we love a dramatic queen live Mm -hmm. on um so the tradition was in our classroom that we would all wear black for valentine's day we would still get the little valentines or whatever but it was called Valentine's stupid day and i live for that now (laughs) that's so nice I love that. <laughs> That's so nice. I love that. So yeah. so you and Tyler don't do anything for Valentine's Day then because it no. is not a holiday in your household. It is not a holiday. Also, okay. I would say, and this is just me being sappy, so buckle up for that mm-hmm. too. Oh, here we go. I know what you're going to say already. Can I you, say it for you? I know uh, sure, go ahead. I mean, yeah, go ahead. This is what she's going to say, everybody. Okay, she's I'm ready. Gonna say, I think when you're in a relationship, every day is Valentine's <laughs> Day. It's close. It's pretty close. What I was going to say is very similar. It, I would say if you don't treat each other like you're just as special outside of Valentine's Day, you're not doing it right. Yeah. So if you want to do something romantic, feel free. But everybody else thinks it's romantic. And I just kind of feel like it's another day. You should just mm. kind of treat each other that way all the time. And then the day after is half off chocolate day, which is important. Honestly, that is the more important holiday. Uh, I agree. <laughs> February 15th, everyone. That's the real <laughs> Valentine's the real Day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> well, I'm so glad we got that off our chest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would say. Anyway. All right. So before we get started, as always, um, we don't know what we're talking about ever. <laughs> And if you think we do, that says a lot about you. Um, <laughs> that you're still here also. <laughs> but um, so don't take any of our advice. Don't, mm-hmm. you know, do anything that we say because, you know, we're not experts. No. Um, but if you want to learn about things that you may not have learned about slash comment on things that we messed up in the episode, mm-hmm. please do so. 
Um, and we encourage you to do your own research slash share your knowledge on our platform and let us know what you think. Um, also, my own disclaimer for this one, I want to yes. be very clear and state that I have never created, operated, or utilized a submarine before. Okay. I just want to be very clear on that. I feel like I need to say that. Yes, ma'am. I don't anyway. think anyone assumed that you did. But, uh... Uh, there's been a lot of assumptions in the last year about, okay. uh, you know, construction, constructioning. Is that a mm. word? I've made it I work. I don't know. Of submarines. Okay. Oh, you're right. You're right. So I want to be very clear. I have not participated, so I wouldn't know. Got it. Got it. But... Yep. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you have good news today. So yes, I do. <laughs> All right. So this is more of just like me reporting on something cool happening more <laughs> than like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's your news programming noise. Okay, great. <laughs> um, as opposed to like good news, but I guess it, it's good news and i titled it oklahoma gets to do something cool <laughs> how ambiguous i love it all right so um you may be as surprised as we were to learn that the tallest building in america might soon reach for the skies in oklahoma city the 20th most populated metropolis in the united states <clears throat> developers submitted a plan for the legends tower for a proposed development project called the boardwalk at Bricktown. Hmm. The building, if approved, would arise in the southern state of Oklahoma and become the sixth tallest building in the world. Uh, keep listening for a list of the most tallest buildings <laughs> in the world. So very exciting. Um, architecture company AO and real estate developer Madison Capital drew up plans that would make the structure the tallest in America, surpassing the One World Trade Center in New York City, currently the seventh highest in the world. Hmm. The symbolic height of 1,907 feet honors the year 1907 when Oklahoma was admitted as the 46th state of the United States. Oh, um, quote, Oklahoma City is experiencing a significant period of growth and transformation, making it well positioned to support large scale projects like the one envisioned for Bricktown, said Scott Madison, CEO of Madison Capital. Um, the development would feature three smaller buildings alongside the Legend Tower that will reach 581 meters and feature a public observatory at the top. Along with a restaurant and bar where visitors can enjoy the sweeping views of corn. And I added the of corn part. <laughs> um, That's not pretty to be accurate. shady. Um, spanning approximately 5 million square feet, the project would be mixed use, including a Hyatt Hotel, several condominiums, 1,776 residential units ranging from market rate to affordable amidst abundant retail and restaurant areas. Quote, we believe that this development will be an iconic destination for the city, further driving the expansion and diversification of the growing economy, drawing in investment, new businesses and jobs, said Madison. Uh, we hope to see the boardwalk at Bricktown stand as pro as the pride of Oklahoma City. Hmm. Um, so now what you've all been waiting for, the tallest buildings <laughs> in the world. Yes. Number indeed. one is in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, which is the Burj Khalifa, um, which is 2,717 feet tall. Fun fact, my husband, Chris, has been there and gone to the top. Um, number two, um, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Um, it is 2,000... 227 feet tall um in shanghai china the shanghai tower which is 2073 feet tall um mecca in saudi arabia which is the or mecca saudi arabia has the um i don't know how to pronounce it but it's a clock tower that's mm. 1971 feet tall um, China also has another one on here that's in Shenzhen, which is Ping and Ping and Finance Center, which is 1,965 feet tall. The Oklahoma City Legends Tower would be 
number six, but right now the Lot World Tower in Seoul, Korea, um, would be is at number six and then obviously the world trade center is number seven yeah that's a lot of tall buildings i i get mm -hmm. why they did 1907 for like the whatever founding but my goodness i strive for mm -hmm. the sky for real like 207 2718 feet would have beat out dubai's like the all the way to the ocean i mean that's fine you know <laughs> How many can we fit into the Mariana Trench? You remember <laughs> how oh many Lord. Lincoln memorials is that? <laughs> how many Lincoln memorials is that? <laughs> That's the only way Americans measure things. That's fact. If you don't tune into the the <laughs> Twitch stream, it is completely unhinged. So just be aware. If you haven't listened to the Deep Blue stream pod, highly recommend it. There's a lot of great things. <laughs> it's on the YouTubes. So. YouTubes. All right. Um Let's see. So the next uh, good news mm -hmm. is what I've entitled Forever Young. <laughs> Forever Young. Thank you so much. Uh, that's exactly what I was thinking. You're welcome. Um, so the Fountain of Youth has excluded ex eluded explorers for ages. Turns out the magic anti-aging elixir might have been inside us all along. Whoa. I know. Karina Amor Vegas and colleagues at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory have discovered that T cells can be reprogrammed to fight aging hmm. and they can have lifelong effects. Given the right set of genetic modifications, these white blood cells can attack another group of cells known as senescent cells. These cells are thought to be responsible for many of the diseases we grapple with later in life. Hmm. Senescent cells are those that stop replicating as we age and they build up in our bodies, resulting in harmful inflammation. While several drugs currently exist that can eliminate these cells, many of them must be taken repeatedly over time. As an alternative, Amor Vegas and colleagues turned to a living drug called CAR T cells. Um, and they discovered CAR T cells could be manipulated to eliminate senescent cells in mice. The results published in the journal Nature Aging showed the treat the treated my mice ended up living healthier lives. They had lower body weight, improved metabolism and glucose tolerance, and increased physical activity. All benefits came without any tissue damage or toxicity. If we give aged mice if we give it to aged mice, they rejuvenate, said assistant professor Amor Vegas. We give it if we give it to young mice, they age slower. No other therapy right now can do this. Perhaps the greatest power of CAR T cells is their longevity. The team found that just one dose at a young age can have lifelong effects. That single treatment can protect against conditions that commonly occur later in life, like obesity and diabetes. Quote, T cells have the ability to develop memory and persist in your body for a really long periods, which is very different from a chemical drug, explained Amor Vegas. Quote, with CAR T cells, you can have the potential of getting this one treatment and then that's it. For chronic pathologies, that's a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. Patients who previously needed treatments multiple times each day could theoretically get an infusion and be good for multiple years. CAR T cells have been used to treat a variety of blood cancers receiving FDA approval for this purpose in 2017. But Amor Vegas is one of the first scientists to show that CAR T cells medical potential goes even further than cancer. Amor Vegas's lab is now investigating whether CAR T cells allow mice to live not only healthier, but also longer. And if the same thing happens in humans, the elixir may turn out to be the real fountain of youth. That's super cool. It is cool. I mean, it's got to start somewhere. And the fact, the good news is since the FDA has already kind of approved their use in other medical mm -hmm. technologies mm -hmm. it's sometimes from what i understand it's easier for them to be utilized elsewhere because the approvals for the main portions of the treatment have already been approved agreed so that's also great in terms of like how fast these things happen because you and i both know that it just is a slow process when it comes to right. a lot of this stuff right well, and I think too, it's about improving the quality of life for your yeah. whole life. You know what I mean? Like, so you may not be living necessarily like longer, but 
you have a better quality of life all the way until you know you die basically and yeah. that's that's cool because i think like the 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 years preceding death can be kind of yeah. rough for yeah. a lot of people so i think yeah. you know this is a cool thing that is super cool i love that well all right, Kirsten, tell <laughs> us about tell us about some Mercibles. <laughs> well, I mean, they're pretty cool too. Also frightening. I would say one of my personal fears is being stuck in a water tube um mm -hmm. thousands of feet below the surface, if I had to say. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I know that there's some very brave men and women <laughs> who are out there doing uh all all kinds of stuff and that's not even military i mean military do but there's also like scientists that are out there um mm -hmm. trying to explore the ocean and get us more information on what's around the world so um you know thought it would be interesting to explore um we'll go over official definitions but then there's a couple of different things that we can talk about so um the official definition for a submarine or sub is a watercraft capable of independent operation underwater. And this is different from a submersible, which has more limited underwater capability. Uh, but I do intend on kind of speaking on both. Uh, the term is also sometimes used historically or colloquially to refer to remotely operated vehicles and robots, as well as medium sized or smaller vessels, such as the midget submarine, which is so cute, and the wet sub. Um, submarines are referred to as boats as opposed to ships. I wouldn't fit it in either one of those categories. I would my, just say submarine. <laughs> my favorite way to irritate Chris <laughs> yes. is to call. So he works on ships, right? Yeah. Like really large <laughs> ships. Yeah. And I love to call them boats. Ah, because sweet it makes little him boats. very irritated. Uh, um, nice. And that, boats. and that is just something that we like to do together. Honestly, that's love at its finest. I think so. <laughs> if you don't know how to irritate your partner, do you really do you really know them? I hey, mean, you know what? Friends included. If you don't know how to push right. the wrong button, I mean, right. Right. <laughs> do you even really know them? Right. Uh, I, I also enjoy calling them both. <laughs> it's great fun. It's mm -hmm. great fun. Uh, of course, much of our knowledge on submarines does actually stem from military expeditions. Uh, but like I just said, there's also deep sea explorations that, you know, are being used and the history all kind of co-mingles together a little bit on how they came to be. So the first half, I'm going to discuss the military part. And the second half, I'm going to talk about the submersible kind of exploration part. So cool. Submarines may actually date back as far as 332 BC, which is insane mentally to me. Um, there are references apparently in history mentioning Alexander the Great going down into the sea in what was a glass barrel because he wanted to study fish. So that's he was in a fishbowl looking at fish. <laughs> it's like seems dangerous. But okay, <laughs> fishception. Um, if it is true though, the concept of submarines has been floating around for about Stop 1800 it right now <laughs> it's been floating around for about 1800 years i mean it's better be floating than sinking around so <laughs> william bourne wrote inventions or devices in 1578 describing the principle of making a boat sink and come up by changing its volume and in this book by contracting the volume the ship would sink and by expanding the volume it would rise However, the precise way this was done in 1578 when all this was written isn't really clear, but of course now we have modern techniques and materials that have made it possible because we have submarines. That <laughs> is correct. If you Good want job. an yeah, if you want an Just example. In case you wanted to know what this is about. It's about <laughs> submarines and we do actually have them. It's so funny <laughs> that you say that cuz we do. <laughs> cuz we do. So Military subs, unfortunately, <laughs> this is really sad. So um, if you don't like sad things, I guess don't listen to the first half. <laughs> oh my God. When it comes to this kind of technology, as you can imagine, um, it's pretty risky. 
is what we'll say. You have this tube that you've constructed constructed with man-made products that you're not 100% sure about. At this time that we'll talk about is like Revolutionary War period. So you also don't know that much about the ocean and like pressures and you barely know all the continents <laughs> on the <laughs> right. on the globe. You've barely explored the world. Right. <laughs> so um concepts of the ocean very small. All right. So Unfortunately, it didn't start that great militarily. <laughs> the first American submarine was designed before the Revolutionary War by David Bushnell, a young inventor from Connecticut, and he designed and built a one-man submersible vessel that he called Turtle, which is actually really cute. That is cute. Uh, but Turtle featured a hand crank screw like oar that moved the boat forward and back underwater, air pipes that brought fresh water, no, fresh air into the boat, because you would drown if it was water, fresh air into the boat. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Just want to clarify. <laughs> if you don't know what drowning is, go back to Blair's swimming episode. And <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, ballast tanks that took on water to dive and then, of course, would empty it to ascend because you got to find a way to make something that's naturally going to float sink. And then a primitive torpedo <laughs> to attack enemy ships. Turtle was not messing around. <laughs> Turtle? I imagine. So primitive torpedo to me makes me think of like they just had like a really long stick. <laughs> and they just like right and they right. just had a bunch of guys or like in the or the i guess it was a single person this so, guy like, the single person in the in the submersible yes. Yes. would hold on to the stick and like mm -hmm. half of it was like inside and the other half was outside and then you just like wave it around <laughs> this man had a personally made bottle rocket strapped to turtle <laughs> which couldn't ignite because you're underwater <laughs> Good job, turtle. <laughs> Love this. Okay. And this is our military, everybody. However, <laughs> I, no, 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 no. However, I will say, I will give them their credit because sure. this was in a time where yes. we didn't even have like tanks or anything. Right. Right. It was just like rifles and everyone stood in a line and that was it. <laughs> you just marched out from your house. Right. And just that's it. Yeah. Got in line. Not everybody had a there. horse either. To be fair. You're, you're so yeah. right. Yeah. So right. Turtle was like next level. Okay. Yeah. All right. So encouraged by George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, Bushnell adapted his vessel to use against the British during the war, which also makes me chuckle internally. Uh, but Turtle was sent to New York Harbor in September 1776 to surprise the British. And what a surprise it would be. <laughs> Uh, who were blockading the city at the time. So if you don't know history, that's what was happening. I'm uh, interested to know, and you might get to this, but I'm interested mm. to know if like the British had any version of this or they just like saw I don't know. this thing like come up out of the water. <laughs> like, like, what like, is what that? The heck? <laughs> that would surprise me. <laughs> I know. I'd be like, wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't get to it, unfortunately. Um I have no idea, but it would be funny to to like research. <laughs> I know. Well, because and the, especially because like the British army was like the most prominent in the world at that right. time. Yeah. So you would think that their technology <clears throat> would be like cutting edge. But I mean, I think maybe their ships were. Sure. But I think like the underwater vessels were still very new. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Turtle's pilot during this was Ezra Lee. Um, and so they crept up on what was the HMS Asia and attempted to attach explosives to the side of the wooden ship, but failed completely before losing control of the boat. Sag. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, Lee escaped, but tried again to attack the British one month later without success. Um, despite Turtle's failures, Bushnell proved that a boat could be used for underwater surprise attacks, though at this point, very unsuccessfully. <laughs> Very, very true. Mm -hmm. Turtle tried. Between the American Revolution and the Civil War, many individuals experimented with submarine technology, including American Robert, uh, Robert Fulton, an inventor and promoter of the steam engine, which is where you may have heard his name before. And I do plan on doing a train episode at some point, so we'll probably talk more about him later. 
Um, but in 1800, Fulton completed his version of submarine, Nautilus, and Fulton's design introduced elements that may be found in modern submarines, such as adjustable diving planes for easy vertical maneuvering underwater, a dual system for propulsion, which is just its movement, and a compressed air system that would allow crew ab about four hours of underwater, underwater travel. So... Yeah, that's kind of vital. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for the time. <clears throat> and as naval surface ships continued to develop throughout the 19th century, submarines were still considered experimental. And as far as our Navy goes at the time, they were also considered very unsafe for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, However, during the Civil War, both Union and Confederate forces experimented with the submarines. One such experiment was H. L. Hunley, named for its financier, Horace L. Hunley, and his boat sank twice in training missions, killing 11 crew members, including Hunley. Uh, and despite this tra tragedy, uh, Hunley was called to battle on February 17th, 1864. Um, so even though it was an abysmal failure, they still used it. <laughs> the way that that's written it makes it seem like they <laughs> resurrected the, the guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was resurrected and called to battle. That's my B. I should have um, respecified. They recalled the boat to battle, the not boat, yeah. the one who passed. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is fine and i think any yeah. logical person would be able to do that but i just think nah. it's funny that's all <laughs> so when they recalled the boat uh it was powered by nine men who were working a hand cranked propeller and the hunley set out underwater to attack uss house satonic in charleston harbor hunley's crew used its our torpedo to attack and sink it and Hunley became the first submarine ever to sink an enemy ship however it never surfaced again and lost the entire crew <laughs> damn <laughs> like uh. you know <laughs> obviously the question here was safety okay that's what I'm that's what I'm jiving at all right I mean <laughs> they completed their mission they did complete their mission it did get better um, technology also improved uh, and design would also improve. And so 10 years after the end of the Civil War, uh, a man by uh, the name of John Holland, who was an Irish born, began designing and building submarines in the U.S. And he submitted his first design to the U.S. Navy in 1875, which at the time was completely dismissed as impractical because of the history of the previous a loss of life associated with them so there's so we're saying a decade later yeah they we're were still like, like nah, no because it didn't work in the civil war it's never gonna work <laughs> correct seems about right i mean to be fair if the last two missions of the last one had entire crews completely decimated it's true it's you true. know i i can kind yeah. of see where they're coming from um but Instead of getting discouraged, Holland just kind of saw this as a challenge, so he went back to the drawing board for the redesign to improve the construction, and by 1888, the U.S. Navy then recognized the potential for submarines in its fleet and held a design competition for a new underwater vessel. Um, Holland ended up winning the competition and then began building what was called the Pludger five years later after experiencing difficulties with the pl oh, sorry plunger the end got cut off there um the plunger which makes a lot of sense holland mm -hmm. began work on another one named holland and i don't know roman numeral six so thank you mm -hmm. for his sixth submarine so we're jumping um he introduced a new method of propulsion using a gasoline engine um, he also designed a small, lightweight gasoline engine that turned a propeller while the boat cruised on the surface. Super helpful if you want to, you know, move a little bit and then dive deep. Um, the engine would run on a generator, a machine that produced the electricity, of course, to charge batteries necessary to run an electric motor under the water for operations. And Holland's effort proved successful, and he was actually able to persuade the Navy in April of 1900 to purchase the submarine, and it was added to the fleet as USS Holland SS TAC-1 six months later. Cool. Yeah. Um, 
as submarines have developed through more ages, um, there was also different things that maybe weren't the best to use. One of them being gasoline because it's highly flammable. Um, <laughs> you know, mild problem, <laughs> mild. So just imagine being in the, um, you know, the underwater death tube and having the gasoline just explode. Um, that's a problem. Uh, the gasoline being unstable and flammable um, and also using this fuel in a combined environment just kind of re brought up the idea of the endangerment of the crew on board. Mm -hmm. Additionally, you have batteries and electricity running underwater, <laughs> which again, not great. <laughs> so now you have a scenario where the material in general is very heavy very bulky, kind of inefficient, and can potentially explode. Horrible. What they decided to do is around the time Holland was creating all these different submarines, German scientist Rudolf Diesel, so just kind of let your brain think about where we're going with that, mm -hmm. developed an excellent substitute for the gasoline engine. Diesel's engine used a fuel that was more stable than gasoline and could be stored safely. The engine also didn't need electric spark to ignite the fuel, which is another great safety feature. And these advantages plus improved fuel economy granted submarines with diesel engines longer and safer cruises on the surface. While underwater, batteries were still necessary to provide power. And after 1909, diesel engines would be used in American submarines for nearly 50 years. Uh, they would also um, first become a major factor in naval warfare during World War I, so 1914 to 1918, when Germany employed them to destroy surface merchant vessels. In such attacks, submarines used their primary weapon, which was at the time a self-propelled underwater missile, or a torpedo. And submarines played a similar role on the larger scale, of course, in World War II, so 1939 to 1945, in both the Atlantic by Germany and the Pacific by the United States. So they definitely gained popularity. They were becoming more efficient. They were being used more safely in combat or however. I mean, I don't know if you could really say safe in combat in the same sentence, but you, the crew was safer uh, while operating them. So. And then uh, one of the final kind of big moves in terms of how and what they were using to operate is, of course, um, despite the success of the diesel powered submarines, the quest for a single power source continued because remember, they're still using electricity, which is still dangerous. Yeah. And so the concept of nuclear powered submarines kind of became discovered also by a German scientists. Um, and this was in 1930 ish. Upon learning of the idea, of course, American physicist Ross Gunn visualized the potential for nuclear power for submarines, and Philip Abelson first sketched an image of one at that time as well. The most recognized proponent of nuclear-powered submarines in the Navy was Admiral Hyman G. Rickover, and Rickover managed a research team that converted the concepts of nuclear power into working submarines. Um, and if you don't know, uh, nuclear power uses atoms, which are, of course, our smallest particles of an element, to produce an enormous amount of energy. And that allows power plants on submarines to superheat water and create steam. That, of course, then powers a turbine that turns the sub's propeller. And now you've got movement with very little effort, essentially. As my husband likes to say, <laughs> hot rock makes steam. <laughs> Boat, boat go room. I'm sorry. Is this a sauna? <laughs> Hot rock, rock steam. Make, make steam. <laughs> boat go room. It does go room, actually. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Scary water death tube go room. <laughs> Scary water death tube go room. Um, so with these, submarines could supply the necessary power for them to travel up to 500,000 miles and stay underwater basically indefinitely without the need to refuel, which was huge. 
Um, Rickover convinced the Navy and the Atomic Energy Commission that nuclear power was the ideal propulsion method for the submarines. And on January 17th, 1955, the first nuclear powered submarine, USS Nautilus, which is SSN TAC 571, went out to sea. And on her first voyage, uh, Nautilus traveled completely submerged in the Atlantic for more than 1300 miles. It's crazy. Um, and then in 1958, she traveled under the polar ice cap and reached the North Pole. Also stinking cool. <laughs> Super cool. Now she's a cold <laughs> death tube. <laughs> Today's fleet of American nuclear submarines is able to spend up to six months on submerged patrol. They have two complete crews. And when a boat returns from a lengthy cruise, the crews will rotate, of course, because that's a lot of time in the death tube. Definitely. And since the vessel is refueled only once or twice over its lifetime, there's actually no need to stop for gas, which is right. fantastic. But of course, you do still have to worry about food and supplies, so <laughs> you will have That's to dock necessary. eventually. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> humans do need sustenance. It's very true. And then the last little bit here is just kind of like an overview of today. So the submarine community is a small force and it delivers a huge impact providing unique capabilities to operational commanders because of course it's a different type of vessel. It's floating underneath the water. It can come up, go down, whatever it needs to do. Um, as the maritime security environment has evolved into an asymmetrical war fighting scenario, uh, there's new weapon systems and you know different ranges that these vessels would need to travel or go and you know you don't know where you're going to end up so it's nice okay. to have these different kind of options um so today's submarine force is uh about 53 fast attack submarines and 14 ballistic missile submarines and four guided missile submarines and they all have different functions they all have different things that they're the best at um and so yeah we got a big old fleet of water death tubes I mean, if you look at what we have compared to what we started with, I mean, <laughs> it's a big scale. It's the water death tube. For me. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, honestly, you would never find me in one. I'm going to be very, very I, upfront yeah. about it. My claustrophobia yeah. could never. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, I heard it's quite crampy for obvious reasons. Um, you know, don't smack yeah. your head. I'm kind of short, though, so maybe it's not a huge problem. I feel like it, that's more of a tall person. Problem, yeah. <laughs> You're probably right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I can't lift up my legs uh, very high, so I feel like trying to, like, step over the doorways. You ever been on, like, a field trip to, like, I, yeah. walk? Yeah. Yeah. I, so know, we, we a, have been... I'm going to crack my shin. <laughs> because of who I'm married to, we have been <laughs> to many ship museums too many. and... We have had many experiences where you can go and like look on the ships mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the doorways baffle me how people don't trip. I know. I don't understand. I get like, okay, so I get why, because then you can seal sure. the doorway, which fine. is fine, but like it's incredibly <sighs> inconvenient. Can you imagine for a moment and trust, I don't get it, right? Can you imagine for a moment waking in the dark water death tube, having to go to the bathroom, forgetting where you are and stubbing every toe, kneecap, uh -huh. hip. Uh -huh. You're just bumbling around yep. <laughs> in this dark. I can't. I can't. <laughs> First of all, ow. Second of all, horrifying. And you have to share a bathroom with like 50 million other people. I don't even like sharing with my husband. So I know. <laughs> I know. Get your I, own room. You know what? It's so good that we are not in the military. <laughs> it's I so think, good. <laughs> I think it's good that we are not. And on that note, we'll leave you for a break. Tired of dealing with lawn work in the sweltering heat of summer? Or maybe you're not a fan of being attacked by spiders while raking the leaves in the fall. I know I'm not. Uh, no matter what lawn and garden service you need, we have a solution for you. If you live in the Richmond, Virginia area, KT Maintenance LLC is your one-stop shop for lawn care, brush removal, and even mulch and rock delivery. Whether you need commercial or residential services, each job gets a free estimate from owner and operator, Chris Thornton. To get your free estimate today, call Chris at 804-986-8270 or send an email his way at ktmaintllc at gmail.com and get your lawn and garden feeling fresh. 
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are not on the surface yet. We're still underwater. So hold on tight for the second half. We all live in the yellow submarine. You know, the why does it have submarine. to be yellow? You know, I don't know. It significant? It's because the Beatles were on drugs and they wrote that song. Oh, that's probably true. Mm -hmm. Still iconic. Still um, iconic. So in the second half, like I promised, we're going to be talking about a different kind of submarine-like um, machine. And I say like because they're called submersibles, which is technically different. So a submersible is an underwater vehicle which needs to be transported and supported by a larger watercraft or platform. So mm -hmm. as we discussed, submarines can do what they want when they want. Submersibles, not the same. If you've ever seen those like Titanic documentaries yeah. and they like take the big boat and they have the little small boat that they release into the water, that's yes. what a submersible is. Exactly. And of course, they also have many different uses. And in this case, submersibles are usually included in oceanography ventures, underwater archaeological ventures such as the Titanic, or even like, you know, when they say, oh, the lost city of such and such was found however many feet below the surface. That's also when these come into play. Mm hmm. And apart from size, the main technical difference is that submersibles are not fully autonomous and they rely on support facility or vessels for replenishment of power and breathing gases, <laughs> which I'm glad that they decided. Breathing Breathe. gases. <laughs> <laughs> breathing gases is a very interesting term. <laughs> Um, they also typically have a shorter range and operate primarily under the water. So there's not a lot that are happening on the surface, but its whole function is to go underwater. So it really wouldn't make a difference if it was able to go on top of the water, you know. Um, so some operate on a tether or umbilical cord um, kind of connected to a tender. So that platform or other boat mm -hmm. and they have been able to dive over 10 kilometers or 33,000 feet below the surface, which is really cool, which is why we have a lot of some of that really deep underwater footage. Um, they can be small. Um, they can only hold a small crew if they hold a crew at all, because not all of them do. And they have very dexterous mobility provided by propeller screws or pump jets. Well, and typically we're using these well, I guess another use would be like mm -hmm. if we as humans can't survive in that particular right. depth or whatever, then we would use it's kind of like sending a rover to the moon yeah. or something, you know, Same exactly. Thing. I mean, honestly, the ocean is like our Earth space. So. <laughs> what? <laughs> brains <laughs> you know ocean is just earth space <laughs> it's a very wet version <laughs> that's but what yeah. you just said that's i just a, want you to know that as a space as a person who's no space expert i stand by the statement <laughs> all right <laughs> all right let's talk about history shall we mm-hmm <laughs> She's going to be hooked up on it the rest of the time. Uh, the first man dives to the deep ocean took place only in 1930. So remember when we were just kind of discovering this submersible idea or the submarine idea, we were talking like Alexander the Great time. But when it comes to this particular type, it's as early as the 1930s. Uh, and this is when a man, William Beebe and Otis Barton, descended to a depth of 245 meters in Bermuda. Over the following years, this team of uh, engineer Barton and the naturalist, who was Beebe, advanced submersible technology, achieving a dive of 923 meters on August 15, 1934. The next significant milestone wouldn't be until 1960. So we're talking like 30 years later. Yeah. A secret U.S. Navy project, actually codenamed Project Necton, saw Jacques Picard and Don Walsh descend seven miles down in the bathyscape Tresty, which I didn't pronounce that right. Tristy. What is a bathyscape? <sighs> Questions. Can I look it up? I'm going to look I it mean, up. I mean, by all means. Live and in charge. <laughs> 
Reaching the bottom of the Challenger Deep, the lowest point of the Marianas Trench in the Pacific Ocean, they were the first people to achieve full ocean depth, which is crazy. Oh, okay. So a bathing scape is a type of submersible. Oh, okay. That holds like a small crew. Okay. So so this is a manned one is yes. also good to note. Yeah. Um since 1960, though, several governments and university institutes have embarked on scientific research of the deep ocean. However, relative to the size and significance of the deep ocean, the world's submersible capabilities have far to go. Uh, we, I, I think, I, I don't, I hate to bring it up, but the reality is a good notation of how far we still need to go is actually the really sad submersible expedition that happened last year um because uh even though that particular submersible was obviously not made for what it was doing we'll mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. the scale of the operation however controversial to try and retrieve it is also something of note and we'll talk about this later in terms of like scale we talked about how many submarines the u.s has for example mm -hmm. there is a there is only a global scale of submersibles that can actually reach uh, in, important depths when it comes to things like rescue missions and things of that nature because the technology has kind of not surpassed yet gotcha um, and we'll talk about how many that is, but it's literally extremely few. So few that there's a global scale instead of a country scale. Mm -hmm. So just kind of want to put that in perspective. Um, I feel like it's important. <laughs> Don't build your own submersible. Anyway, the other thing that we have is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. And the average depth, if you don't know, of our ocean is about 3,600 meters or 2.2-ish miles. And scientists require special equipment, of course, to visit regions that have these pressures. You have extreme cold. It's dark. so It's hard mm -hmm. to get through it. And over the last few decades, the technology has kind of developed and refined so that we have a few vessels capable of visualizing and sampling these environments. And NOAA's submersibles are um, deployed from the ship where they record and collect from the water column, sea floor, those kinds of ranges. But there's also different types that NOAA specifically utilizes in order to do these different functions. There's the human occupied vehicles, which is the one we just talked about, HOVs, remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. And you might've heard some of those about space expeditions as well, mm -hmm. the rovers and autonomous underwater vehicles or AUVs. So the HOVs transport that small team of scientists and they pilot directly to the seafloor for a very limited amount of time. And similar to other submersibles, they are equipped with tools like lights and cameras and sensors and things that you would need. They have mm -hmm. special arms and instruments that they can use to grab or move things out of the way. Um, and this is unique because you're physically in it. So you can see and operate in real time underwater with the HOVs. The ROVs or ROVs are tethered underwater robots that they use uh, to research, explore, collect images in the water column, but they're tethered to the ship, allowing control signals to be sent and received directly between the operators on top and of course the vehicle. And this collects samples via man manipulator arms as well, but they're operated away from the machine. And then later they'll analyze you know whatever samples they bring up but it's it, it's helpful because they can go deeper without somebody in it and so i right. feel that's really why they're implemented in that way and then of course the autonomous ones are pre-programmed robots that just kind of drift and dive or glide through the ocean without any control. like roombas like roombas ocean roombas <laughs> ocean roombas <laughs> 
And they collect high resolution sensor data, which provides detailed information. And once deployed, they operate completely on their own. Um, some of them do kind of have like a pre-planned pre route that's kind of, um, I guess, programmed for them. And it permits the scientists to conduct other research while this thing is just kind of, you know, do to doing along the ocean. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. So that's super cool. The portion about how many globally we operate at these really aggressive depths um, that are manned enough to be able to do things like rescue operations is what I wanted to hint at earlier. So the HOVs are... Um, I mean, they have their own setbacks, right? Um, they're, they have to be manned. You have to have supplies. The technology and the parameters are different because you've got somebody in it. We can get pretty deep with it, but as a global amount, there are 13 and only 11 are presently operational. And they're operating from France, Japan, Russia, and the U.S., um, so when a tragedy like this happens, or if we have to go deeper for some reason, yeah, it makes it difficult because we don't, we have it, but it's scattered about the globe. So it's not condensed into one region where it's right. easily accessible. Right. And two, they're limited too. out of those, there's a, only one. And I think it's from France based on the, you know, the highlights from that whole situation france is the only one from my understanding that could even have been at that level that they were supposed oh, to have been so interesting right so when you think about it like that even though technology has obviously increased and we have these beautiful tools in in events like that it can be really difficult because we can't we can't get to you right um, so practice safety submersing <laughs> i guess um, you know, things that people are considering when they're submersing, especially those that are trying to improve the technology, um, atmospheric pressure is really important. Earth's atmosphere has a pressure, as we know, uh, similar to how water exerts pressure due to its weight. But unlike water, the atmosphere is compressible because it's gas and water is water. <laughs> it's a different element so there's different things that you have to consider and the maximum atmospheric pressure is experienced at sea level actually decreases while increasing altitude so it's like the backwards thought of pressure oh that's interesting yeah I did not know that it's trippy um, depth measurement as well. So single atmosphere submersibles have a pressure hull with internal pressure maintained at surface atmospheric pressure. And this requires the hull to be capable of withstanding the ambient hydrostatic pressure from the water outside, which can be many times greater than the internal pressure. So something else that they um, have, the ambient pressure submersible, will maintain that same pressure both in and outside the vessel. And the interior is air filled, of course, because you have to breathe. And at a pressure to balance the external pressure, so does the hull does have to withstand that pressure difference. So it's like, okay, you know, it's a lot of pressure under pressure or something like that. Yeah. Um, there's also something very adorable called the science of floating, <laughs> which Ooh. is very important as well. So when an object is submerged in a liquid filled container, the level of the liquid rises of course mm -hmm. it's an intriguing phenomenon and occurs because the object displaces the liquid pushing it out of the way before the object comes in contact with the liquid it exists in a state of equilibrium with the weight of the liquid above being balanced by an upward force called up thrust so that's your your floating mm -hmm. however once the object is partially immersed the up thrust which previously opposed the weight of the displaced water starts acting on the object itself and consequently objects submerged in liquids appear to weigh less due to this buoyancy force which is the other thing that they have to control for because if you're on top of the water and your goal is to be underneath the water for any mm -hmm. amount of time you have to not be buoyant that's right <laughs> you have to counteract that up force or that up thrust so that you can sink but then you also have something that does the opposite so you can come back up <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So there's lots of different things. And this is also the same for submarines as well. It's the same kind of idea. You have to have all of these different science and engineering like questions answered and making sure that all your forces and pressures are accurate. There's this article had tons of equations. I was not going to bore you with that because I don't no. math here. So, yeah. but the, the, if you want to research it more, feel free, but it's a lot to think about, um, which is why I personally think the technology is a little slower. Uh, we haven't discovered a lot of the ocean, but also because we haven't, we don't necessarily have all the factors down that we have to consider. Right. Um, and that is all I have for submarines. <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, you'd never find me in one. I applaud those that do. And yeah. Do you want to know a weird conspiracy theory that I, that Sienna told me the other day? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so you know how you were saying the technology in submarines is a little bit slower, mm -hmm. um, but yet we have found our way to the moon and beyond yeah. mm -hmm. because of NASA. Mm -hmm. And NASA was originally designed for sea exploration mm -hmm. as opposed to space exploration. The space and of the sea! <laughs> so the conspiracy theory is, is that yeah. they found something so crazy and dangerous and weird mm -hmm. in the ocean mm -hmm. that they were like nope we're not doing this and we need to leave. <laughs> and you know what so, kudos for them for bowing out <laughs> well and and so the next the next the plan to like save humanity now is yeah. to like leave. go to a different planet as opposed to yeah. going down in the ocean so what did you find nasa that's what we want to know. That's what we right? want to know. Yeah. And again, there is no factual t evidence to anything that I said just now. <laughs> Hashtag. I feel like we've been saying this a lot here lately, but not a conspiracy podcast. No, not a conspiracy podcast. Just but, sharing yeah. what a fun thought experiment that is. Honestly, it explains why we now have a space force. We are really just doubling down on we the space exploration. Doubling down. <laughs> You know, they didn't call it like the 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 ocean wagon, you know, right? The mm -hmm. the ocean up thrust. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, yeah. I've also heard that recently. I don't. Maybe it was from the same source, but I was also kind of thinking like, wow. I guess when you think about it that way, <laughs> it explains a lot of things, or yeah. explains nothing. What do Hard you say? You never know. Who knows? If you enjoy <laughs> conspiracy, oh, yeah. though. Let us yeah. know. Yeah. Feel free to send us an email with any yeah. questions, comments, concerns, or episode topic suggestions at MediocreContentPodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram or TikTok at MediocreContentPodcast or catch up with us every other Thursday on Twitch um, at the same handle, MediocreContentPodcast at 3 p.m. Pacific Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, or 11 p.m. BST. Uh, don't forget to rate us five stars anywhere you listen to podcasts. Leave a comment on YouTubes or just, you know, tell us what you think. Yeah. Um, and we will see you next week. This has been Mediocre Content. Thanks so much for listening. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>